Hello and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I see a lot of the different locations from all over the world and I love to see the international audience, although it makes me miss travel, which I can't wait to get back to. Anyhow, today is an open question and answer. So this is your opportunity to ask some questions. I see a couple have already come through in the chat, which is great. We can jump into that. I also do have someone who emailed who couldn't necessarily be here, but has a question and is excited to watch the answer in the replay. So I will get to that as well. So if you have a question, I encourage you to put a cue in front of your question, just so I can easily spot those and make sure that I address your questions, especially if I start to fall behind a little with the chat, it'll be easy for me to peruse through and see which ones are ready. Okay, so let's take a look at the very first one, which I am not 100% sure I can answer, uh, but I want I want to try and help. And I think maybe, maybe some crowdsourcing will help. So here is the question. Zoom was working well. After I installed Loopback to use Ecamm Audio, there is no more sound on Zoom, even when I try to choose only the mic. Okay, so I personally have not experienced this problem. I would love to know for those of you who are here with us today, has anyone had that problem? Anytime I have a tech issue where something is not working, I try to walk backwards and I usually try to do it one at a time. So because the new thing was installing Loopback, I would uninstall it, open up Zoom, test Zoom again, and then I would reinstall it. I have not personally heard of that problem where installing Loopback is going to cause that problem. And for those of you who are wondering what on earth is Loopback, that is a, an audio router for Macs. So it essentially allows you to make a virtual microphone so you can combine your microphone with music or guests, bring that into Ecamm so that you can actually play your production or have a guest who's on your streaming software, bring that in. So that I haven't heard. So that is my approach, but I would love to know if anyone else in here has had this issue before or has been able to solve this. Um, seeing, I see more momentum says mic and loopback. I've noticed that a mic connected via USB hub. So not directly into the computer, but through USB has an issue leading to no sound. I'm curious if that is though connected to zoom can't even pick its own mic. And Ben is also saying I've had that issue and it is still an issue with Ecamm loopback and zoom. So have you gotten that to work at all? This is interesting that multiple people have had this. So the short answer is I obviously have not run into this before, but it seems just from here that that has happened. And I like this message. Support from loopback is pretty good. So, uh, but I would always try you know, uninstalling and reinstalling the thing that caused the issue. I don't know if there might be a permission or privacy setting to make sure that you are giving access to things. I don't know if that might have caused if something got turned on or off where suddenly your computer is not allowing those applications to speak with one another. I often find checking your privacy, checking those settings is a good place to go as well. Do your apps have permission to access those things that are asking for your sound and your microphone? And also I'm seeing Patrick is saying a possible fix is in loopback under the menu, uninstall ACE, Re restart loopback and it'll reinstall the audio drivers again. Okay. Thank you, Patrick for that. So this is, yeah, there's <laughs> lots of, lots of help here. And, um, and then I see TJ is saying windows related virtual audio cables. Yeah. So like VB audio is an example of the virtual audio cables and uh, that can be, that's how you can route your sound. I just don't know if that has the same problems. Um, so I appreciate that everyone is helping out and crowdsourcing with that one. So that would be the approach. I feel like we don't have a specific answer, but I would say for um, Marcio, I'm hoping I'm saying that right, that maybe that gives you something to start with so that you can start to explore what is going on. Okay. Um, and if anyone else has anything else that they can... They can refer uh, Marcio to, that would be excellent. All right, so 
I see Ken had a question during the countdown. What is the quickest way to get started with Notion? Hmm. Um, well, the quickest way is to create an account, <laughs> but I think this is where someone who is new to using this tool will, there's a debate between whether it is worth starting with templates or starting from scratch. And I would say it depends on your personal tendency. For example, when you use someone else's template, it can be nice to have some structure already in place, have some properties already set up, but I often find anytime I've used someone else's template, and when I say someone else's template, I mean there are pages that you can duplicate into your own workspace. For example, I have a template that I shared recently in how to track your tech. And so it's really just a table that I've created. It has all the properties set up. It's got some fields already filled out so that it saves you some time. And then you can always customize that and change it. But I actually find usually when I download someone's template, I'll just use it as a way to learn. And then I'll go and actually just set up my own. And I do have a video that I call Get Starting, Get Started in Notion, where I just have, you know, starting a database, starting a page, and just start with one thing you know you want to track. Don't try and do all of it at once. The tech example, I had someone reach out to me, they used the tech template and they actually created their wish list for their studio and said, I'm really excited and now I, I'm starting to see why you love Notion so much. <laughs> and so that's an example where just pick one thing, even if it's really simple, like you know, maybe having a library where you just track what are some articles I wanna read, videos I wanna watch, courses I wanna take or I am taking. That can be a simple way to just organize something in Notion and then see what you think, kind of get used to it, get familiar. And then there are so many amazing resources online for free for Notion. Um, and then if you want to go deeper, you can actually, you know, sign up for a course or take something. But I would caution, regardless of what you do, go at your own pace. Because if you jump into a course, for example, I took Notion Mastery and I'm now actually an instructor in Notion Mastery. And that is one of the ones where the first few office hours I attended, I was like, whoa, you can all do all those things, but I didn't quite know how yet. So you wanna make sure that you take your time and you will get there. So if someone does something that you cannot understand how they just did that, just don't worry about it, <laughs> slow down. So that would be a little bit of advice. I could probably talk for the whole time about this, so I won't, but that would be my advice uh, to you to just first start an account and you can play around with their getting started. They've got some stuff already built in when you create a new account. You can also copy someone else's template and start there. Okay, so what else? Um, okay, just looking to see if there are, okay. So here we've got one from Juan. Why isn't this opening? There we go. Um, I try uh, so I tried the circle mask in OBS and having the same image on my camera, but it's not letting me use the two images of the camera. Okay, I might need to clarify this. So the circle mask and having the same image on my cam, it's not letting me use two images of the cam. I Okay, so if I'm inferring what you're asking, if you are trying to have more than one scene with the same camera, so let's say I pick this camera that I'm looking at right now to create a circular image picture in picture, which in OBS, you use a mask, which basically creates that circle feature. And then you can place that on top of say a screen share. So one of the things that I did not, did not share in that video, because I was so focused on here's how to apply the mask that I didn't actually get into, okay, well, what if I want another scene in OBS where I just have my full camera, but now I've applied a mask. So now it's on there again. So in my testing on my Mac, is that you can actually add your camera again as another source. So when you say add camera or video source, I don't have it open right now, but add video source, then you can say, you know, camera full screen, and then you connect your camera again, and this one doesn't have the filter. And so now you have two different camera sources, one that has a mask and one that doesn't. However, I know that this is not exactly the same for Windows users, and off the top of my head, I cannot remember what the fix is, but I do know that there is a fix for Windows users. And so maybe that's something I can actually follow up on and do properly because I don't want to waste anyone's time right now trying to go down that hole. But if you are on a Windows device, 
you have to do something different. And I know there's lots of support in the OBS communities because the person I was going back and forth with, forth with trying to help on this specific topic, they were able to find the answer. It was not the same as a Mac though. So there are differences between the two programs. So I, don't, I first want to ask, is that actually the question you have? <laughs> so you can maybe add or clarify if that's what you were asking about. So I want to mention that. Okay, so... Oh, okay. Here's a question. Not a tech related one. Can you say why you chose buy me a coffee? So really it's just seeing other people using it and uh, seeing how simple it was to set up. I, at the time when I set it up, which I believe was back in January when I totally revamped my channel, that is something where I hadn't seen other things that really are just focused on People can select any amount. And at first I even thought, oh, is this a thing? Do people, is this rude? <laughs> but I realized I did have people reaching out and saying, thank you, I want to support your content, but I don't necessarily need to buy any of your products. Is there something I can do? And so having that buy me a coffee is really nice. Since getting it, it works. So I haven't explored other platforms. So there may be other platforms that work just as well, but really it was just seeing other people that I trust. They were using it and I thought, yeah, okay, <laughs> that makes my decision. I don't need to spend a lot of time figuring this out. So that's, uh, yeah, <laughs> that would be my answer. All right, I see another question uh, from Marcio. I'm an Ecamm fan. I watched your video about Keynote. Uh, what I can't do with Keynote without Ecamm. Okay, so I think you're trying to say, um, so if you don't have e <laughs> If I am interpreting correctly. So what I showed with Keynote and the updates, which are really exciting, the fact that you can add live video to your Keynote production. And so you can be sharing a presentation in Keynote and have yourself on the slides, but you can also recreate a production sort of like I have in my Ecamm. So one of the things that I would say is this is a great option for doing straightforward presentations. You're going to be sharing your screen just like you're sharing slides in a web conference, whether that's Zoom, Teams, something else. The difference, it's not for the virtual camera. So you cannot just use the keynote slides with your video and bring that into the virtual camera. So it doesn't replace the virtual camera. So that's where something like Ecamm or OBS or other things like vMix, those will work for a virtual camera if you actually want to display things directly in your web conference video window. And so it doesn't completely replace it. The other thing is if you want to do any streaming, like I'm doing right now, you would need a streaming software, whether that is on your computer or using a web-based version, like StreamYard or Restream will allow you to go live from the web. Whereas the streaming software, like Ecamm, OBS, vMix, et cetera, actually let you stream live to different platforms. So that's where the, the difference really lies. Those updates with Keynote are really for making a presentation. So that's where you want to focus, but adding your camera can just really elevate that presentation, make it a lot more professional and stand out, connect better with the audience by being on the slide with your material and making it look like a production similar to what you could create in a streaming software. So hopefully that answers the question. Let me know if I didn't fully answer it. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, let's see. Just gonna scroll through. I wanna make sure I am finding the questions. And I see this is regarding the Zoom audio from before. So David is saying, so Zoom in Windows, doesn't always follow the system sound settings. So check your audio settings in Zoom. That's another great suggestion. Look in the application itself to see if there are the, those sound settings. All right. Okay, so Stefan has a question about, have I used vMix? So the answer is, uh, I had a very brief <laughs> experience. My, so my PC is a Dell that I bought about four years ago. And at the time had no intentions of, you know when they always ask you, what are you gonna use this computer for? And you know that if you say fancy things, they're gonna charge more. <laughs> And at the time I was not creating anything. I was trying to maximize my budget. It's just not strong enough. So I did download vMix onto my Dell 
and it was so slow and I couldn't do anything. And then I hadn't really watched the tutorials. So when I was trying to do stuff, it made me want to throw my laptop out the window. That being said, I have a lot of friends who use vMix. They are adept and very good at it. And it can do some really cool things, especially the thing that I'm most jealous when it comes to vMix is doing sort of stingers and really cool transitions. That's one place where vMix really is much stronger. If you are doing streaming, I think vMix is a great option for Windows users. Absolutely, I'm just not your girl <laughs> if it comes to learning it. So that's my answer to that one. All right. Okay, so question here from David. Where have you tried putting your teleprompter? I'm debating between above one monitor or between two monitors. Okay, so this actually brings an, up another thing that I wanted to say. And I might, I don't know if I said this recently on my tech setup question, um, video, but on my tech gear, so I'll just show you what this looks like. So we've got my studio set up. So I have a link to this in the description. It has everything in my studio, except for some of the lighting stuff, which I'm going to update in time for my lighting walkthrough of how I upgraded my lighting. However, one of the things you'll notice for the Caddy Buddy, where's my Caddy Buddy? Here it is. So the Caddy Buddy teleprompter, this is the one I use. One of the things you'll see in this picture is that it does have sort of a track and that track, and I wonder if I show, let's go to my overhead. Yeah, you can't really see it. The camera is sort of covering it, but it does go pretty far back. Like right now, the bars are almost touching my new curtains. <laughs> so one of the things that is a slight disadvantage to the Caddy Buddy, if you are looking, to, you know, if you said, oh, what does Cat use? that obviously works. I like, I like the Caddy Buddy. If you are tight on space, then the Caddy Buddy is probably a little bit too deep and might cause problems with how, where you can place it. So that's where something like the Glide Gear TMP100, which a number of my friends and colleagues use and trust, and it works well on many fronts. So it's been vetted by people. That is, I believe, shallower, but you always want to check the measurements when you are incorporating a teleprompter. Now, that being said, let's answer the actual question. So when it comes to placement, it depends on the size. So with a teleprompter, you're always going to have a base and then you might have, like in my case, there's a bit of a track that goes backwards. So it does have some depth to it. It also has some width depending on what you have. If you are thinking about getting a smaller teleprompter, there are ones that work with a phone then those are much more compact. You could probably fit one of those between two monitors and it wouldn't be too much of a difference. This, if I were to actually take this and try to put it between, my monitors would be really far apart and that would be difficult for me. I think also if you have an ultra wide, well, obviously you'd have no choice in your case, obviously you have the ability to move things around. I always say if you can play around with the setup, the, the one thing in particular about my setup is I have it arranged so that it works well for standing. Like right now, I am standing up. So directly in front of me, if I just put my arm out, actually it's kind of hitting the top of here. So the camera is higher. When I'm seated, that's when I wanna use this camera, which is my second camera that I just added to my setup recently. And so when I'm seated, looking up at the teleprompter is a little bit more uh, a little bit more awkward. I don't like to do it as much. And that's a trade-off that I decided to make because I prefer to stand when I'm doing live streaming. And usually when I'm doing training, I'll be standing and I'm not doing as much with the computer. These are reference notes, etc. So that's what I decided personally. Uh, but kind of test it out. I know that's not super helpful, but when it comes to your space, I did want to reiterate for anyone thinking about a teleprompter, take a look at how deep it is to make sure you have enough room. The other thing about a teleprompter is what is it standing on? So if it's on a mount, first of all, you want to make sure it's strong enough, but also you want to make sure it's balanced because the teleprompter itself will have where the monitor sits and also behind it where the camera sits. And you want to make sure because it's got some weight to it that it's sturdy and so you also have to make sure that whatever is supporting it can support it properly so that it stays up. And I am using an actual camera tripod, which someone asked me recently what tripod it is. It's over 20 years old and it was purchased at Henry's Camera in Canada. 
but I don't actually know. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I can't see it. I think it actually is a Henry's maybe custom brand, but it's, it's really old. So I don't actually know that. I hope that helps. Okay, I see a question here. Um, so what made you want to move to Thrivecart? So this is a specific question to, uh, so I have a course called Elevate Your Online Presentations. And I recently, one of the reasons I don't have a topic today is because I've been spending the last number of days <laughs> transferring my course from its old platform to its new platform. And I just said, you know what, today we're gonna do an open Q&A so that <laughs> I'm not super stressed out. So I previously, so for anyone else who is thinking about or offering courses and is thinking about platforms, this is my experience. <laughs> so I first used Kajabi and Kajabi is a nice kind of all-in-one platform, but I wasn't actually using it for anything but courses. And I personally, I found that it looked really appealing. I had taken some courses as a student with Kajabi, but setting up a course felt like a lot of different steps. You had to have a cover for the page and then a cover for the module. And you had to have all of these different things. I found setting up the course took a, a lot of time, even though it's very visually and aesthetically appealing and has some really great features. That was a drawback for me. It also, I'm still pretty new in starting my own or running my own business. And at the time it was very expensive contrasted with the amount of money I was bringing in. <laughs> and I just thought, I don't think this is sustainable. So when I learned about a new beta last year, which is new Zendler, so it's a newer course platform. I did some research on it. I was able to test it out for free and I liked how easy it, I basically recreated the, the same course and found that I liked how simple it was to set up the course. It did have the native Stripe integration so I could take payment on it. And I was allowed, or not allowed, they hosted the videos, which was really nice uh, because some course software, especially more affordable course software, will ask you to host your videos somewhere else and then you link them. So I liked that. I ended up changing course platforms this the past four or five days <laughs> because um, Thrivecart, which is what I use to sell my course, um, it it released a new course platform option, which was already integrated. If you were a Thrivecart, if you were a Thrivecart customer, you automatically got this course platform. And then there was an add-on option that you could add for uh, 195 US. And one of the things I know, sorry to anyone who's like, I don't care at all about this, but I know some of you do. So what happened was when I was using my old course platform, I had two different currencies because I am Canadian. And if you run a business in Canada and you have Canadian customers, you need to make sure that you are properly handling your sales taxes. So I have a Canadian page and a US page. And so I needed to use an external cart. And when they offered this course, I decided to check it out. I tested it. I liked it and it actually streamlined the process for me so that I have my course and my sales in one place. Um, there were a few other benefits to it, but essentially I just, I, streamlining. That was the biggest thing and uh, it is streamlined and so I'm happy with that. <laughs> so now anyone who decides to buy Elevate Your Online Presentations as of, kind of yesterday onwards will actually just they go to the sales page that everyone else went to, but instead of redirecting them to the new course platform, it'll just automatically give them the lessons right away. So I also like that from the student experience side. Okay. <laughs> um, if anyone else has questions about that, let me know in the chat. I see another question here. Is it profitable running YouTube channel? So um, I would say, so profitable? No, not just a YouTube channel on its own at this point in my size, <laughs> if you were just talking about monetization. So for anyone who is not familiar, in order for your YouTube channel to be monetized, meaning you're part of the YouTube partner program, you need to have 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 watch hours in the last 12 months. So it's not, you know, if you've had it for five years and you slowly are getting the watch hours, it still needs to be in the last 12 months. So enough traffic. Once you hit those milestones, you can apply to be part of the YouTube partner program. They can run ads and they take a share and you get a share. So I would say, um, so 
I'm trying to think. I have two channels. Both of them are monetized. One is about my gray hair. <laughs> this channel is, it used to be that my gray hair channel was bringing in more money than this one, but then this one has been doing a lot better. So now this one <laughs> makes more money. And full transparency, my YouTube partner program revenue is around five to six hundred dollars a month at this at this stage, where I am in October 2021. Um, so that's not enough to pay my mortgage payments and groceries, etc. It is a really nice lump sum of money to get towards my business. Um, although I did kind of laugh when people say, "Oh, that's nice, an extra five hundred dollars a month if you take all of the time that I spend." Um, putting towards the YouTube channel, I would say right now at my size, it's it's probably not at the best hourly rate, but it is, um, I would say, like as you keep putting to, like keep putting in your effort, there are people who eventually do transition to make YouTube a full-time job, but that does, uh, it takes time, it takes a lot of consistency. Um, that is not my primary intention. I like to teach, and so I like to teach on the channel, I like to teach in courses. I also like, to, so I teach my own course. I'm now being, I'm an instructor in Notion Mastery. So I like to find ways to teach. That's my primary business, I would say, the trainer and facilitator. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has follow-up questions on that. Happy to share. Okay, so um, I'm not just going to check if that's a question. Um, Mick, I'm really excited to see, it's not a question, but... I like that you are trying to improve your presentations online. That feels really good. Okay, so I see this question around content. What is your process to maintain a consistent, regular content? So going live, <laughs> that, that is the answer. Going live at the same time every week. I am what's called an obliger, if you are familiar with Gretchen Rubin's Four Tendencies. So essentially... The four tendencies tells you how you respond to inner and outer expectations. And as much as I wish I was a person who just decided to do something and then did what they said, that is where I struggle. That is not my natural tendency. Whereas, it, whereas when I am responsive to external expectations, like, hey, you have to show up Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern to, to make content that is going to force me to create consistent content. And that is why this channel is predominantly live stream like by a lot. It's because this is the way that I can manage and maintain a regular schedule. It's saying I'm going to go, going to go live and then going live. And if it was just all recorded videos, it's not to say I couldn't do it. It's just that the live forces me to do it in a way that I can kind of almost tell myself, well, I can be flexible, or maybe if I don't do it this week, and then I can do it this day, I start to make um, rationalizations, I guess, or justifications, and I start to, yeah, so that's my answer. <laughs> that is live streaming for me. I also enjoy it. I enjoy the interaction. I enjoy um, having people here, which was not always the case. Just any, anyone who's frustrated, if you are live streaming, I had months and months and months of either no one or one person or two people, or maybe like three or four was really exciting for me. That was, that was a very, that was my typical experience for quite a long time. So just stay with it. Don't give up. All right. Um, uh, so what has been the key to your success on YouTube? So first of all, thank you, Ken, for saying that. That's very kind. I, and I do feel, I feel very proud of what I've built this year this calendar year on YouTube, I will, I'll give the short answer because prior to January, I was a flat line, flat line. Like if, I don't know if anyone, I saw, I shared my stats, I think back in July on Twitter, but I basically had almost no, no growth at all. If you looked at my stats for my channel and then I thought, okay, something is not working. I've been doing this long enough, enough, many, enough months to realize I'm not making any headway. So I started to pay attention to the questions people were asking me, which was not about the content I was making. It was about how I make the content or how I showed my slides in that Zoom presentation. How did I add that graphic? What are you doing to make that happen? So I started to pay attention to what people were coming to me asking and also what was making a difference because when I would give them information, they were really excited at being able to make a change. So 
what I stumbled upon, I had I learned about this topic of ikigai, um, which is a Japanese term. I apologize if I'm saying it incorrectly. And the way that I've learned it is that it's four different things coming together. So something you like doing or, and, or yeah, I think you enjoy it. You're good at it. The world needs it and people are willing to pay you for it. And I realized that that was what was happening, that the stuff I wanted to, the stuff people were asking me is stuff I actually enjoy teaching. I believe I am good at teaching this content. People need it right now, especially right now. People need better Zoom presentations. And there are people who are willing to hire me <laughs> to help them with it. And so that I think is the recipe for, whereas before I enjoyed doing it, I think the world needed some of this stuff, but people weren't necessarily looking for it. There was no urgency to it. So it just, there wasn't, something wasn't landing. Um, whereas then once I stumbled upon, not stumbled upon, once I realized, okay, I'm going to give this a try and it was working, I got traction. And so I just decided, okay, I'm going to keep doing this. Something is going well. The other thing I decided to do specific to YouTube, because there's a couple of people here who've asked about YouTube. I think it was in the spring. I heard someone say, stop asking for subscribers and they they said just make content worth subscribing to and that was that really resonated with me and so I decided that I would stop asking for subscribers and so I haven't actually said that in a video or a live stream I can't remember exactly when I stopped but sometime in the spring and that did not impact people subscribing to my channel I have, there are sometimes when I'm watching a video where someone says something about liking and I actually am reminded, oh yeah, I guess I can, I can like this video. So I do get that that's a thing, but I also just try to adopt that philosophy of just put out valuable content, stuff that is helping people. And if they want more of that, then people know what to do. They know how to, how to click that button. All right. Um, okay, so what do you recommend for a best camera for Zoom meetings? what's yours. So I have the Sony uh, ZV-1 or ZV-1. I also just got the Sony uh, ZV-E10. Both of those are on my gear, which I think I actually do have a gear link. Here we go. Whoop, there. So if you go to this website, you can see all of my gear, exactly what I'm using, a few things to be added. And so you'll see that. As far as though, what's the best for Zoom? You do not have to buy a mirrorless camera. You know, you don't have to spend $700,000 or $1,000 on a camera, depending on where you live. There are some good quality cameras that you can get for around $100. And I have not tested them all out, but you just want to make sure you're visible. I would focus first on, do you have clear audio? Can people hear you clearly? Before I would worry too much about the camera. Also just playing with some of your lighting and your background. So making sure that you're, your camera is at a good level so you don't have the up the nose shot on Zoom and just making sure that you are well lit and visible. Even if you have a built-in camera, you can look far better with that by making a few adjustments. So you don't have to break the bank, but I would say if you are thinking of buying a camera, if you can, instead of paying like 100 or 150 or 200 for a webcam, maybe save that money, wait a little bit longer, and then get your hands on a better quality camera that you can use for more than one purpose, which is also a nice, a nice thing to do. Okay, uh, so I see, a I'm probably really behind by the way. I see a question, can Ecamm do stingers and transitions? So Ecamm has some transitions, but not in the, in the sense that I mentioned in vMix, not, not at the moment. Hopefully that's getting better. Okay, so, um, okay, I see this is, this looks like a question. When recording a class taught via Zoom and with a second teacher and gallery participants, how do you make sure the video just shows the teacher while they are presenting? So that is where you can spotlight or pin a person. And so that will, um, that's, if you're the host, you can spotlight that teacher so that you make sure that everyone is focused on that person. And you can, you can do that for more than one person. So if you had two people that you wanted to focus on and then be in speaker view, so that will be showing, that'll focus on the people who you have spotlighted and you can just remove spotlight when they're done. Um, but that is what I would use for that. Okay. 
Uh, I see this question here. Is the webcam on a MacBook Pro better than the Logitech C925? I cannot speak to the Logitech, that specific one. I have never used it. I would say it depends. So I think my MacBook Pro camera is better than my iMac camera at the moment. There's an announcement next week um, with the new Apple MacBook Pro and new iMac, I believe. <laughs> I am, I've been waiting for that for a long time because I do want the new processors. So the, the M1 chip or M1X or MX2, whatever. <laughs> I don't know all the jargon. Uh, Rene Ritchie is the guy for that. But um, what I will say is the newer ones, I think, are a lot better. So if you are thinking about a new one. But I would say take a look at, I always Google. Like if I'm thinking about something I'll, or go to YouTube and look at comparisons or look up the exact one you want and look at the, the difference. I did for a while. Before, so before I got this second camera that I have set up here, I did put a webcam on this camera because for me, the lighting was, I always looked really, really washed out when I used the built-in camera. So I used just a webcam, Logitech C920, so probably quite similar. And I did think the picture was better, but sometimes it lost focus and that was actually really frustrating for me, but I didn't look just so like, uh, it was just, I was completely washed out. Okay. Um, wait, let me see if I understand this question before I post it. Okay, so I'm going to share this so I don't, so I acknowledge the question, but I don't think I can answer it. So I want to add a website via web widget source, I'm assuming in, in your streaming software. I don't want to share my screen, but I can't interact with the website after I've added it to the web widget. Is there a way to interact? So the answer is I don't actually know. I have not tested that. <laughs> um, but I would say if you can, like if you don't want to share your screen, but you just want to share a website, that's where I would consider trying out NDI because NDI can just bring in the website as a source. And then that way you're hiding things from your screen, but you're able to interact with the website. The alternative could be if you have a second device, maybe whether that's a tablet or a second computer, bring that into your production. And then that way you can actually just use the separate device. So then you're not sharing your screen, which is also more draining on your computer as well. So adding a camera overlay, either with a secondary source through a cable or through NDI, those could be options so that you can still interact and show something on the screen. So maybe I kind of answered that. <laughs> um, okay, so, oh, okay, question from Robert. Are you interested in trying out any of the ATEMs? So not really yet. The reason for that, so for anyone who's not familiar, so ATEM is a camera switcher. So there are a number of different ones. There's the ATEM Mini and ISO and all all the different types. I considered it because actually a lot of people I was working with had them. And so it was hard for me to help them with their setup because I didn't have one. I didn't have experience. However, what I teach really is more, it's a better fit with software than it is with a camera switcher. There are benefits to a camera switcher. So one, it acts like a capture card. It also takes some of the load off of your computer. But one of the drawbacks to the camera switcher, the ATEM, is that it you have to just pick one source to come in. So for example, I was working with someone who had a whiteboard and they had their camera and then they also had their computer all coming into the ATEM. They could only ever show one thing at a time. And also they could set up their scene a certain way, but their, their tablet was a different ratio than their camera. And so then all of a sudden, their, the way that they had positioned it on the screen, they had black bars down the side. So I just, I find because of my setup and because of what I'm doing with my production, that the camera switcher does not necessarily make sense at the moment. So that would be my answer. Doesn't mean never, but for now it doesn't really make sense. Okay. Um, I don't know the answer to this one. Does the latest Zoom block OBS and Cam Twist? Do you know how to overwrite this? If anyone else in the chat has a uh, an answer to that, let me know. I haven't heard of that until now. 
Okay. Um, all right. Oh, and then I guess that's similar to, to the other one. Why don't you get an ATEM instead of Stream Deck? So St Stream Deck does a lot more than the ATEM. There are some things you can do with overlays, but it is much more limited. And so I the stream and I use the Stream Deck for my productivity as well. Although I've had some frustrations since updating my operating system, which I did in order to get that keynote update. And sometimes when I try to launch applications, I just get a message that that application is not open. And I was like, yeah, mm -hmm, that's why I pressed that button because I'm trying to open it. Okay, uh, so Rod is saying, how do you bring a second computer into Ecamm? So I do have a video specifically addressing how to bring a second computer in. The short answer is a cable. So actually plug it in with a cable if you have ports left over. Um, and the next, so cable can be like the actual native cable. Um, if it's a computer, HDMI cable into a capture card into your main computer. And then also you can use your, you can use NDI, and then I have a video on how to set up your NDI. Uh, that's another option. It makes it show up as a camera source. And so that would be the other way that I bring in a second computer. All right, so, <laughs> um, oh, and yeah, no worries. I don't mind outing myself. I thought about right off the top telling people like, why does suddenly have, why is she suddenly doing an open Q and A? Um, that's why, it's to keep me sane. All right. Um, oh, interesting. So Rod, you're saying I tried the HDMI into CamLink, but it was so slow or delayed. That is interesting. And I'm not sure if anyone else has experience. So I, I would maybe try a different cable or a different capture card. I would also take a look at how many things are running on your computer. If there's just a lot going on, it can just slow everything down. Um, that would be where I would look first, but that is, I actually, that's my preferred option, HDMI to capture card. I find faster than NDI and I don't notice a delay. So I would say maybe take a look, close everything that you are not using. And because you're trying, one of the benefits of the second computer is you offload some of the processing for your computer. So that's what I would probably do first. Ah, yeah, Daniel also bought the Thrivecart Learn. Yeah, I did decide to grab that. And in case anyone is, if I go back to the course software, the Thrivecart Learn Plus option, which enables things like bundling um, and a few other, a few other things, it was 195 one, a one-time payment. So not a recurring payment, not a subscription. I, that might not last forever. Um, so that's a pretty good deal. <laughs> it's actually a really good deal. All right. Um, oh man, I think I'm super behind. Let me just, I do not have the question or the answer to this, but if anyone else in the chat does, it's a, a, well, so streaming other than Zoom. So I would say it depends on what you're trying to do. If you are just looking to stream outward and you don't need a two way. So Zoom would be if you have guests with you and you want something private, but there are ways to stream with better audio that's not Zoom it just depends on what you actually need. Do you need to have people on the call with you? Are you teaching people? Or could you do something like a private embed or like Vimeo or other hosting or put it or even an unlisted YouTube video to get out to people? And then you can actually use a secondary chat application if you want to talk to people. So you might want to consider that as far as something similar to Zoom, a web conferencing system. I personally don't know, but there are people here who might actually know that. Oh, and I'll say, I, Rod, I'm not doing one-on-one -on -one consults anymore just due to time constraints. Um, TBD, whether that might come back, but uh, it just, it's, I'm trying. So Operation Keep Cat Sane is going on right now. So I'm trying to say no to as much as possible. And I hate it because I'm a people pleaser, but I have to do it in order to maintain some sense of sanity. Okay. <laughs> Um, oh, tr filler show travel. So I am actually going to be, I'm trying out, this is, you didn't ask this question, but I'm just going to share it with you, <laughs> is that I am trying a new system. It's called the eight week work cycle, where you have six weeks of focused work on one or two projects. 
And then you have your buffer week where you kind of wrap up loose ends, you prepare for the next work cycle, and then you take one week sabbatical. I'm really excited for this because I think it suits how I work. My first sabbatical is coming up uh, at the end of October. So I'm gonna have a recorded video for that week. And then I'm also traveling for work and so I'm going to have another recorded video. So there'll be a couple of weeks coming up soon where I will not be live, but I will have content. <laughs> See, it is me publicly saying it. Now that I've said it out loud, I'll do it. <laughs> um, and if anyone wants to, it's learn about it. It's Blanc Media, B-L-A-N-C. Uh, if you just look up eight-week work cycle, you can see some blog posts about that. All right. Um Okay, Stevan, I'm in the process to start making tutorials, how-tos, but wonder how often is reasonable to release them. Some have two, three a week. This is all about your own pace, I think. I, I, find, I find one is sustainable. I think a pace of more than that. Like when I was regularly doing two channels, I, I really slowed down like a lot on my other channel um, because also my gray hair transition is almost 100% complete. Anyway, that aside, I, I found that that was a lot and it depends on what else you are doing. It depends on your workload, but you it should not stress you out. So if you cannot, if, if you find that that's really stressful, don't do that to yourself. <laughs> so I would say maybe start, and if now early on, I can see the benefit of when you are just starting to create content and get out there, be, if you can do a couple a week just to get some content, get stuff out there, um, you know, you have to have at least three videos before you're even discoverable if it's on YouTube or somewhere else. So I could see maybe front loading it, maybe even recording some stuff in advance and then releasing some at a little bit more of a pace, but then finding a pace that's sustainable um, because you run the YouTube channel. The YouTube channel does not run you. That's there's <laughs> there's some free YouTube advice from me who learned the hard way. Um, so Mick says, does NDI support just one instance of each input type? Can you save one scene and then switch to a different source of the same type? So no, if you have NDI, it shows up as a camera. So it would just, you could just pick that camera just like in any scene. You can pick your main camera. You could pick a second camera if they're set up. So for example, I have, this is my overhead camera. I can I can go to this in any scene if I want to. I can set up in multiple scenes. NDI is the same way. You can set it up. You can just add it to multiple scenes. So once once it shows up, it's you can select it. Okay. Let's see. Uh, so this camera, so the one I'm using right now, the Sony ZV-1 is, is just built in. My new camera, the Sony ZV-E10, does have an interchangeable lens. I am just using the kit lens for now, although you're not seeing it because I'm not using that camera. <laughs> but if you want to see it, uh, let's do a little cam too. This is the other one. It does have a little bit more of a matte look to it. It is at a different angle, but this is the second one. I'm just using the kit lens right now. So um, what else? Okay. What lens do you suggest so I would say it depends on what you're trying to go for. And I talked about this recently with one of my students. What do you want? What's the effect you want? Because I, I went with the kit lens primarily because I'm not necessarily trying to go for a full blurred background bokeh effect. Uh, it does have the option to make sort of a fake one. But if you actually want some of your background to be visible in, in what you are showing, you don't need to go with a really, really low f-stop. So the lower the f-stop, the, the sh more shallow the depth of field is, meaning it only focuses on a, a small sliver of and the picture and everything else is blurry. Uh, so it's more expensive if you are going to go that way. But obviously going to that lower f-stop, something like a 1.4, that is going to give you that effect or you can go up to that effect but it depends on what you need. And because right now I don't really need that, or that's not necessarily my goal, I was fine with my kit lens. The kit lens here is 3.5. So on both cameras, I did go to the lowest f-stop that they have. So it is focused more on my face rather than the background, but uh, it depends on what you want. And, that, and then based on what you want, that's where you choose your camera. And also your, your lighting. Maybe you have really low lighting 
you might want that larger aperture, that lower f-stop, because it's better in low light situations as well. Okay. Um, there's also some really nice comments from you, but I'm just, <laughs> I realize how behind I am. I this morning I was like, I'm gonna keep this. I'm gonna keep this short. I'm gonna keep this like 30, 40 minutes tops, and I'm not doing that. <laughs> um, okay. Where do you make your overlays? Keynote. That's an easy one. I make them almost all in Keynote, occasionally Canva, but almost always Keynote. All right. Um, okay. Yes, Patrick, don't have the window behind you, but also you if you do have a window and you can't move your computer, just make sure you are well lit as well. Okay. But do, do um I'm just gonna say thank you. <laughs> I love makeup, so I appreciate that comment. All right. Uh, do I have a Patreon page? I do not. Uh, okay. See, I'm trying to trying to get quicker. Uh, yes, the C920 does help. Okay. I'm going to stop with the comments. I'm going to go to the... Um, oh, okay. Yeah. That's too bad. All right. Okay, Anna... I use OBS and want to start bringing in a guest. I watch your tutorial, but I just found a tutorial of Ninja OBS. What are your thoughts? I haven't tried it yet, but I would say enough people told me about OBS Ninja that I would give that a try. Um, and I know there, I think there's at least one or two of you in here who have tried that, but I say, why not <laughs> give it a try if you are willing? Um, okay. And so it looks like you guys are helping each other out with some questions. And I'm getting a specific camera question. I have not tried either the Canon M50 or the Sony a6100. Is it really worth the extra cost? This is where I would go this anytime I'm considering making a purchase that's a big one. I go into either Google, but mostly YouTube, and I'll search for comparisons. I'll search for reviews. I spent, I watched a lot of videos on the Sony before I made any purchases so that I could see what am I looking for? What's most important to me? And and then make the decision based on sort of gathering a, as many perspectives as I can. And also asking other people who have genuinely tried those products. And there are a lot of people out there who have. I am just not one of them. Okay. Uh, let's see what else. Okay. I'm going to scroll <laughs> so far behind. Um, oh, okay. Okay. Mick, I think you missed, yeah, I definitely, if that's your question, I did misunderstand it. So you're saying if I change the NDI source in one scene, will it change in every scene? So if you, let's say you're running this scan converter and it is connected to, you're showing a browser. If you go to that scan converter and then you decide to choose an application, yes, that will change what's coming in. If you, cause that scan, let's say the scan converter is one source. So what you choose to show in the scan converter, that matters. The other thing is, let's say if you're using NDI capture from a phone or tablet, what you show on the screen, if you change what you're showing, that will change in the ones where you have set up that camera. I have tested using scan converter and I think it's called Sierra or Sienna. I'm forgetting what it's called. I haven't used it in a while. It is another NDI um, program application. And so that enabled me to have two different NDI sources coming in and then that would be a way you could maybe get around it you just have to see is your computer strong enough to handle running more than one scan converter because i do find the scan converters can be a bit of a drag all right um thank you terry it's great to have you here all right uh okay yeah people have to leave <laughs> because i'm taking so long <laughs> okay what else here so let's say, always look, okay, thank you. Oh yeah, I really have to. <laughs> All right, um, question, here we go. And then we'll, we'll get this wrapped up. So when I transfer uh, via USB, my folder of Ecamm scenes from an iMac to my, the scenes change. Yeah, okay. So this is, this is a challenge. And I believe this is a challenge for OBS and Ecamm where you have, where you store your graphics matters. And if you move your graphics, suddenly your scene will not have those graphics anymore. So you wanna make sure that you are placing your graphics in a folder where you intend to keep them. 
if you are overhauling your file and organization or you're going into a new, now if you were going from say an iMac to a MacBook Pro, like to laptop, et cetera, I would try and set up the exact same folder um, properties. So if it's like user, Cat Mulvihill, documents, graphics, and it's in the exact same folder setup, you might be able to recreate it. So it goes to look for the same file pathway. If there's someone else who has tried this, it didn't work, let me know. That might be something you can do to help if you have really set up like in a, a bunch of scenes and resetting those up is going to be a pain, but I have, I've done that. I've had that happen with OBS. I've had that happen with Ecamm. You really want to try and stick to keeping your files in the, in the right place. Okay. Um, all right. I've got a few thank yous. Yeah. Other people have to run. I get it. Um, Thank you so much for everyone who joined me today and I hope I answered your questions. I actually didn't answer the question that was emailed to me, but I'm going to email, I'm going to email her back <laughs> so she doesn't sit through a full 55 minutes wondering where the answer to her question is. And uh, I'll probably do another one of these later down the road. And uh, yeah, in the meantime, thank you. And I will see you next week. Same time, same place. Bye.